Culture is the biggest persistent buzzword in business, and in principle, it's a good one. However, most organizations get it so wrong. Culture, team building, values, there are massive amounts of money, time, and energy invested in attempting to get these right. And most of it's fake, delusional, or unstable, so prone to be broken with a single change in leadership or structure. And I'm going to explain why. Ahoy, Peter here from Brighter Training, and today we're exploring the complete mess that is workplace culture. Now, this is a cool subject and important, so if you really want to challenge your leadership style, your business success, and your team, I highly recommend that you grab a coffee and take 10 minutes out to reflect. Why is culture important? It's how we attract the best candidates. It's how we keep control of a thousand moving parts. It's how we manage safety, results, compliance, and conflict. It has an impact on mental and physical health of employees, which goes beyond the workplace. So why do organizations get this so wrong? Well, there are three main reasons. First of all, culture is basically the personality of your organization. And most people don't know their own personality. That's why we have personality profiles and therapy and astrology. Then you put two or 10 or 100 people together and the problem compounds. So most people don't know how others perceive them and leaders who represent the culture have terrible blind spots since they see the culture as a reflection of them. So defining a culture is basically a wish list of how we want to be perceived. It's not an accurate reflection of reality. Secondly, culture can't be proactively defined and locked in. It's fluid. It's like you can't have a child and decide on its personality and mandate who or what they become. Culture is a reflection of a series of behaviors, trust, connection, safety, and I guarantee that companies will talk about diversity and inclusion as part of their culture, both because it's the right or cool thing to do, and discrimination is illegal in most places, but diversity means difference, which means a whole lot of change to the culture. And thirdly, culture is an attempt to artificially create something that organizational structures are not designed to support. So if the culture is positive, it's unstable if the business is going to grow and evolve. So culture is about people, and people are complex, and this is critical to understand, so stay with me. It impacts teams of all sorts, and it's especially crucial for business. But before we can understand what's happening in the workplace, we're going to need a quick educational neuroscience refresher. The one thing you absolutely need to understand is that the brain is a social organ. And while that sounds like some modern hippie catchphrase, it's a vital piece of the culture puzzle that most organizations get wrong. So here are five things that you need to know. First of all, the brain requires stimulation and connection in order to survive. Deprive us of that and the brain shrinks and eventually dies. Terrible experiments in the past showed that infants deprived of human contact had a range of significant developmental problems. Secondly, the brain has systems dedicated to understanding social cues, body language, threat analysis, and forming connections. It is a fundamental purpose of the brain. Thirdly, conscious awareness and conscious processing occur at different speeds. So while we like to think that we're rational, in the moment people, we actually take action before truly analyzing the situation. Upward of 95% of our daily behaviors are automated and unconscious, simply because we don't have the time to process and rationally assess everything that we're exposed to. So our responses are heavily guided by our assumptions, our biases, beliefs, and filters. Now fourth, fear and stress, so your threat response and that fight or flight, shut down systems within the brain. And this makes sense. When you're in a life or death scenario, you don't have time for rational assessment and soul searching. You need to act. So our prefrontal cortex, which allows innovation and creativity and rational thought, shuts down and we work on instinct. Lastly, we analyze others, but not ourselves. Again, the brain is wired to assess external behaviors and threats. So we are much better at reading motive and intent in others, not so good at understanding ourselves. 
So if we operate automatically and it's based on the brain's social systems, then the culture needs to be honest, authentic and predictable or we enter that threat mode. And managers are always better at assessing others than themselves. They see non-conformity as a threat to their comfortable system. And so instead of genuine connection and trust, which takes time and vulnerability and courage and ain't nobody got time for that. Managers mandate and dictate culture. And employees play along because they have to. It's the safe thing to do. So this is all cool stuff, but how does it connect to modern business culture? Now to answer that, I'm actually going to take you back thousands and thousands of years. Short version, people lived in a constant state of threat to survive. I'm talking back in our Paleolithic uh, eras. So then they worked out that there was safety in numbers, which led to the formation of tribes and villages. Our need for social connection drove it and our ability to assess threat kept the system stable. If someone threatened the safety of one village, they were exiled. Everyone had a role to play. There were rules, leaders, workers, thinkers, healers, and the work people did was for the mutual benefit of the community. And the safer the community, the less threat that was present, which meant higher brain function. And we see engagement and happiness, innovation, creativity and invention and rational thought. All the things that we want in the workplace. Now things that trigger threat and impact the individuals in the village, so poor leadership, change, physiological threat, uh, fear of isolation and exclusion. And the same thing applies in the workplace, which is effectively a modern village. Then with the advent of industrialization and the expansion of community size, especially after the world wars, work became a mechanical process in which the goal was to produce sufficient food and resources for the population. Individuals made decisions for the group and the balance of power shifted. So going to work became a process of leaving the safety of the village to literally enter a new environment. However, this environment was different from their safe place with different rules and personalities and motivations. Individual rights vanished as people became replaceable commodities. Instead of contribution and activity based on mutual benefit, trust and safety, People were bought and their activity was owned. Leaders didn't need to worry about trust and threat because they owned people. Of course, people still looked for connection and safety since they're hardwired to do so. They formed teams and friendships which supported the fundamental needs of the brain. So though bad leadership and culture resulted in shadow cultures and conflict and underground alliances, managers were less likely to care because people were expendable. And this attitude created additional threat and the evolution of leadership styles such as autocratic or command and control and authoritarian styles, which focused on directive coercion and prioritized the needs of the business over the people. Then managers realized that happy people are productive people. They take less time off, they work harder and faster, they cause less conflict and they cause less risk. So they attempted to increase worker engagement by mandating it. They defined behavioral expectations with policies and procedures. They created performance reviews and scheduled coaching sessions. They defined values and told people to demonstrate them. They repeat those values and vision statements like some sort of hypnotic affirmation. Then they run training uh, so that people can do high performance or they run innovation workshops because high performing teams are innovative. Uh, they find data that says happy teams provide more positive feedback. So they encourage their workers to do the same, not realizing that these people give positive feedback because they're safe and happy. They're not happy just because they get good feedback. So then managers seek comparisons to high performing teams and positive environments, AKA our village. They tell us that the culture is just like a family. Our village is deconstructed and applied to the workplace. And we end up with a list of factors present in a high performing team, a vision, clear roles, feedback, positive culture, trust, fun. Then they add to it, with team activities and social events and theme days because high performing teams connect personally and socially. I'm yet to work with a team that when in a safe confidential environment, totally believe in the culture and values. 
they've learned the rules, they've learned how they need to act. Now they may relate to the values or agree with individuals who support them, but it's once again a one-on-one -on -one connection with a decent manager, not necessarily a feeling of a safe community. I work with organisations that put values in the yearly performance review, and employees need to give examples of how they've demonstrated them. Tick. Or companies that launch values with workshops saying, these are our new values, break into groups and discuss how you'll do them. Tick. I see organisations tell people to be transparent and speak up and that this is a safe environment, only to shoot them down or argue with everything they say or performance manage them when they do. I've even seen contracts not get renewed or people get dismissed for sharing an honest opinion in a safe space. That is not transparency and safety. That is censorship. It's control and it generates threat. And that gets seen by everybody and there's your culture. It's like animals put in a cage at the zoo. If they're unhappy, they don't move much, they don't perform, they get sick. Managers attempt to make them happy by artificially creating an optimal environment. They put in trees and paint a landscape and import sand. Animals learn to perform and adapt or they die. Now ideally, the animals need to be in an open range zoo and ultimately they need to be completely free and then just choose to come back and perform if they want to. Now your employees need to be considered volunteers with a focus on mutual benefit and equality. Because I pay you doesn't mean I own you. Because you need a job doesn't mean I can treat you how I want. Or I can, but that's the whole point of this video. And there's the problem, workplace culture is artificial. Because we've attempted to deconstruct and apply observations that we see in a genuinely safe environment. When we perform at our best, it's because we're safe. We trust the people around us. Their behaviours are consistent and predictable. We can relax and have higher brain functions. So conflict is lessened. We demonstrate empathy. We're open to new ideas because we're not afraid of failure or exile or punishment. And these things cannot be faked. You can't mandate trust and safety. You can't run a workshop for high performance. Team forming isn't a four phase model where people form, norm and perform. Integrity and trust are not values that you can mandate. High performance comes from trust and that is developed over time with consistent predictable behaviours, proven safety and behaviours and environments that align with an individual's neurological and social needs. And it's a shame because organisations have incredible people. People who have done amazing things. They've studied, they've travelled, they've suffered, they've had families, they've failed at things, they've achieved goals. And then we hire them and we put them through training and induction and we assimilate them into our culture. You. Yes, me. Me. and we give them a rigid job description and proceed to assess and direct and limit their input and access to information and we treat them like damaged children. Instead of synergy and environment conducive to high performance, we fall back on models and processes and control, usually out of ignorance or ego or insecurity. Teams can achieve so much more, but the culture needs to change. And leaders need to understand that in trying to define and create a culture, they actually inhibit true brilliance. Psychological safety and respect are, for me, vital. I believe that too many organisations operate from misplaced or toxic places of power. They rely on authority or fear and process to drive adherence and attempt to cover that up with a facade of culture. Instead of a community that celebrates diversity and creates synergy, I see people who are threatened, worn down and exhausted, and managers who mistake authority for leadership. A positive culture isn't a facade that you apply to overcome negativity. It naturally forms as a reflection that your inner workings and processes are actually on track. I like to reflect on questions like, when was the last time you asked people below you for their advice or opinions? Would your management meetings be run differently if they were live streamed to the company? Uh, if my team were volunteers, would they stay? 
Do your processes, procedures and structures support trust and transparency or generate threat and insincerity? If you want high performance, you need to understand the connection between behavior, psychology and neuroscience. A culture that supports high performance and high brain function come from a stable, complex web of sociological, neurological and psychological factors. Without understanding that, it's likely a facade, a leadership delusion or a temporary effect. Now what about those places though that say, we have a great culture and we ask people all the time. The reality is that most people won't bother to tell you how they really feel. They know how to play the game, they know that it doesn't lead to change, or the trust doesn't truly exist. They're not equal partners with a specialised role, they're employees and lower on the ladder. And the most common response to managing criticism of the culture is to just justify it, or deny it, or cover it up with the facade of change. So call me cynical, but show me a leader who says that they have a perfect or great culture, and I'll show you a team who have either given up fighting or a manager who's in denial. Same with engagement surveys, people know what to say. Some will hope for change, but often neutral scores are ignored and negative is written off as an outlier. Uh, others don't bother because it's good enough or not worth the hassle of the training and the workshops and the forced fun that will come from actually raising concerns. Or they know it won't be about genuinely listening to and solving problems. It'll be about eliminating the perception of negativity in the culture. Exit interviews fall into the same bucket. Why are we waiting until people leave to find out what their problem was? And again, I've worked in management teams who receive feedback from HR regarding exit interviews, and they spend the entire meeting rationalizing it. That employee had an attitude. Employees don't understand the pressure we're under. No one gets how complicated it is and we can't just do these things. They might as well not do exit interviews at all. Simple fact is when you try to create a culture via process, you're doing it wrong. So how do you fix it? It's about applying everything that we've discussed in this video. It's about genuine trust and respect and minimizing neuro inhibiting activities. And to do that, you need to use objective measures. Use neutral parties when exploring perception and action, challenge bias and eliminate hierarchy for anything other than operational accountability. And don't mistake process for community. Having a talent review process or policies or diversity committee doesn't actually mean you have a positive culture. It's potentially artificial and it may be perceived as that. Now, not all managers and organizations are ready for the self-reflection, the learning curve, and the change in approach necessary to create a genuine community. However, suppose you honestly believe in the common values that most companies hold up and you wanna support high performance in your workplace. In that case, you could start by demonstrating some of these values, such as vulnerability, curiosity, trust, integrity, fun, passion, and call Brighter Training today to explore a unique approach that you can take to support a safe, high-functioning team. So I hope that gave you some food for thought. If you can see some of these concepts reflected in your workplace, consider supporting trust by sharing the video and discussing it with your team. Now, if it does hit a little bit of a nerve, that is progress too. They say pain precedes change after all. Uh, leave your comments letting me know what the culture is like in your workplace and how you feel going to work or what you do to create a safe community in the workplace. Thanks again for watching and as always, have a marvellous day.